Um, so thanks to Lander Analytics and Jared for inviting me here. Um, I actually attribute a lot of my being here and um, thank you and uh, my career path to him. So thanks, thanks, buddy. Um, all right, intro. Who the heck am I? Um, so my name's Yuri. I work at Glossier. Uh, it's a four-year-old e-commerce beauty company that um, emphasizes choice, peer-to-peer -peer connections, and facilitates um, glowy and dewy skin. Um, and so basically our, what we're known for is uh, skin first, makeup second. That's our mantra. So you can basically say that we're a full stack skincare company with some makeup products on the side. Um, but it turns out this is actually a really good metaphor for our work as data scientists. Um, so we have a lot of excitement about neural networks, lipstick, and cheek color, but not so much missing data, logging, or sunscreen. Um, so to think about it another way, um, we use hierarchical models and random forests and a smoky eye on some uh, occasions, but a smoky eye isn't really appropriate for every occasion. So what really matters is the fact that you're using eye cream as part of your daily routine. So there are base uh, factors that you need to uh, incorporate into your routines, uh, whether it's skincare or your data science work. So my career, uh, basically I started at uh, Facebook. Um, I worked on the marketing science team for about two years, um, running a lot of controlled experiments with advertisers to measure the effectiveness of Facebook as an advertising medium and some creative uh, multivariant tests. And then I moved over to Hillary for America where I uh, managed the digital analytics team um, until I didn't. Uh, and then now I'm about six months into uh, Glossier. And so something that we say in the data science community a lot, uh, I found in my short career in data science is that about one to 5% of our work is about creating models, cross-validating, model selection, the sexy stuff. Um, and the 95 to 99% of the work is data cleaning, munging, sourcing data, um, and that's not so much the stuff we get excited about. So it was actually great to hear the talk before this about scaling and growing a data science group. Um, but let's talk about how to develop a good culture as you develop that group and grow it. Um, and I'm the only person who uses R at my company, so it's really wonderful to be around all of you guys and to nerd out about R. Um, so, uh, just basically this talk is a, a reminder that there are some foundational principles that we all should talk a bit more about, share uh, tips about, and so hopefully this, this fosters communication about these sorts of topics, especially during the, the breakout sessions. So there are four things that I want to talk about um, to categorize the 95 to 99% of the work that we do into for admittedly very broad categories. First, sourcing data. Two, hypothesis testing. Uh, third, documentation. And then the fourth is sharing our work with our stakeholders. But it's a little more fun to use an R code metaphor within those uh, examples. So uh, this is a simple, boring function uh, I often use to count the amount of missing data in my data sets. Uh, a few questions that you typically ask yourself when you're working with a new data set is how much missing data do I have? Do empty strings count? Uh, is there some context that I'm missing around uh, persistently missing data that uh, I might need to take into account? Um, in terms of technical limitations, are there ad blockers? that are preventing me from getting the context from my client side events. Is there imbalance data? But this is a metaphor, so uh, metaphorically what I mean by this is, let's use an example. I bet a lot of us have experience working in digital ad measurement um, where a lot of, there's a ton of data there. Impressions, clicks, uh, timestamps, and 
for better or worse, a lot of the value of those digital advertising campaigns are based on whether a click occurred or not. Um, but a question that we should ask ourselves is, does our key outcome actually translate well to our independent variable? And so in this case, is a click what an advertiser actually wants to measure and optimize for? Eh, kind of no. The thing that they want to measure is the value of a customer lead, is whether a customer purchased or not. Really hard to measure, let alone attribute. Um, clicks, painfully easy to do both of those things. And so something which we should be admitting to ourselves and owning up to ourselves, especially when we're forming inferences off of our analyses and also sharing it with our stakeholders who will inevitably translate um, our inferences to others, is be really careful about how that uh, translation is being done. Um, you can probably see too many uh, really bad examples of that across the internet of how badly uh, data was translated into inferences. Um, but it's not just about translations, it's just about, it's also about what data set are you working with. So you should be skeptical also about where your data set came from. Um, in this past uh, year, 538 uh, wrote, uh, an article, a very honest article, about how they had an inappropriate use of broadband data. I encourage you to all read that. Um, and sometimes, increasingly, the conversation these days is actually around the opposite of missing data. So I don't know how many of you have heard of GDPR, but it's basically data privacy guidelines. <laughs> There's one fan over there. Um, data privacy guidelines that were introduced by the European Commission. Um, these these sorts of laws, we as data scientists absolutely have to be at the forefront of these conversations. We have to talk to the lawyers, we have to talk to our companies about what the impact is gonna be on our work and what the implications are for our ability to serve our customers and our stakeholders well. Um, so money tip one, uh, be honest with yourselves and your stakeholders in order to build your political capital. If you're using a proxy for your ideal measurement outcome, be upfront with yourself and your stakeholders and be careful of what you say because I'm sure many of us have war stories about how there were mistranslations between what you were trying to communicate and how that was taken a step further by others. And at Glossy, admittedly, we haven't totally solved the problem, um, but a few strides that we've made is we actually now own the tech specs for um, the events that happen on our website. So that's one uh, piece of success. And for the most part, I've seen at other companies, the tech team owns that. We have to own those things. Um, so making strides. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is this SQL statement, um, or also a bad joke, but that's subjective. Um, so we, I don't know how your workflows are like, but mine are often write a bunch of SQL and then write a bunch of R. So the metaphor being that there's a lot of pre-work that we have to do before we do the work. Um, so it goes to sh say that for, before beginning hypothesis testing, we have to think about the business question. We have to think about the theory. So we have to define our expectations ahead of time. And before answering questions, which are often causal, we have to ground those in theory. And it sounds really simple, but it, it, it's hard to do in practice with a lot of pressure, especially from demanding stakeholders. Um, and especially with these days, big data being promoted as a panacea, uh, our stakeholders and sometimes us care a little bit less about the theory sometimes, um, but we should Google big data hubris and you'll find a lot of really bad examples of how that was taken too far. And so some practical advice here is actually from one of my favorite TV shows, Silicon Valley. Um, so before often, the main developer characters actually talk about how to tackle a problem. They go to the whiteboard. Um, they, they think about the problem, they, they lay out their expectations, they draw diagrams, often to hilarious effect. Um, 
And I feel like we should do that too. Um, so before, so if a stakeholder comes to you and asks you a question like, does this correlate with this thing? Back them up, get them to the business question, and I want them to expect us to not immediately go to a SQL table or our BI instance and start pulling things around. We should, they should expect us to look outside the window or start drawing things or doing like beautiful mind stuff. Um, so <laughs> let's encourage that from them. Um, in, in any case, uh, I, I want us all to be beta, better theoretical data practitioners and for stakeholders to expect that from us. So money tip two, um, start with pen and paper. Uh, get stakeholders to ask you their business questions, not data questions. It's your responsibility to translate those into data questions. Um, a great example, earlier this week I saw um, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on uh, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and he randomly asked her whether a hot dog was a sandwich. She turned it back around on him and she asked him, define a sandwich. What is a sandwich to you? And then they went to make the foregone conclusion that a hot dog, of course, is a sandwich. Um, so side note here, uh, <laughs> some people don't agree with me. Um, uh, side note here is that something else I like to lay down before actually beginning my work is commenting. So before I start uh, and really dive into an analysis, I'll write a bunch of comments laying out the, the plan for my analysis. First load the data set, then check for missing data, blah, blah, blah. Um, and something I really like about that is that it encourages me to not get bogged down into a data rabbit hole. I'm sure that's a very familiar problem for many of us. And then it keeps you focused on your North Star. Um, so, next thing, um, documentation. So, speaking of comments, um, documentation. Uh, this is obviously a very bad comment. Uh, duh, you say, I am reading in a data set. You are right. Um, this is a bad comment. What I should have said was give some context around the data set, note some quirks, maybe a link uh, to the GitHub SQL. Um, so comments are favors to our future selves. We, this is something that we have to do, not just for ourselves, but also for obviously reproducibility or um, sharing our data sets with colleagues who might then go on to use our own code. Um, if you're changing assumptions, especially with regards to cleaning your data set, it's easier to debug it, it's easy to identify where you made that assumption. Um, it's a, a, a friendly step up for other R literate colleagues who are reviewing your code, if you're lucky enough to have R literate colleagues. Um, but I don't just mean literally, um, I mean metaphorically. So, we all know that there is a replication crisis going on in the scientific community right now. P-hacking, um, so-called no promotion of negative results. Um, big data obviously is um, a, a problem in terms of wanting to make data sets public. Um, it certainly doesn't make it easier to do that. Um, but there are a few things that, that we've instituted at Glossier that help us um, be responsible to our future selves and our colleagues and um, our future colleagues too. So we've established a framework for sharing our work. Um, it's sort of a five part uh, template for how we share our work. First, a mechanism for open commentary and feedback. Um, we use a lot of tools at Glossier, but Google Drive is probably my favorite. Um, we have an executive summary, details about the methodology and why we chose that. A caveat section is really important and then also an appendix where we can share our links to SQL, GitHub, contextual visualizations. And it's really hard to do this at a fast moving startup. Glossier just closed on a over 50 million Series C funding round. 
Um, so people have very high expectations of us, rightly so. Um, and it, it's hard to step back and, and move slowly and document all of our experiments and our analyses. But in the long run, uh, this, this ultimately becomes that much more worth it, especially when you're scaling a team and when you're scaling a company who can quickly grow into silos. So we need the, the, the purpose of doing these, the, this sort of framework whenever you're um, executing an analysis, it just helps everybody else run that much faster. So money tip three, uh, be selfish to your future selves. Write good comments, document your work, um, and be open to critical feedback. It makes your work that much better. Um, and something that we do at Glossier is uh, before introducing our analysis or the outcome of an experiment with a broader group, with the broader company, we share it with a smaller group of stakeholders, with trusted stakeholders uh, who we know are really critical. Um, so next, uh, the last thing. Uh, of course, I had a ggplot reference in here. Um, I love the power of a good, simple visualization. Um, it's a metaphor for the strategy step where we take in before we share our work and we contextualize it for our audience. Um, this can be the hardest part of our work because we're dealing with things like the Dunning-Kruger effect, politics. Again, demanding stakeholders who, who have misconceptions or very baked preconceptions in mind. So if you wanna be effective, if you want your analysis and your work to go far and have the biggest impact, you need to think about your audience and where they're coming from and how to present to them. So I like to game theory it a little bit. Um, and there, there's some really interesting re social science research out there about how you, um, how you can communicate with those types of people. So I encourage you to, to find that yourself. But going back to the previous, um, thing that I said, it's, it, this all starts with a critical feedback period where you're gaining different perspectives about how people might interpret your results and taking those into account and doing that all beforehand before you share that more widely. And obviously that helps you better incorporate different perspectives and be really critical about yourself and expect um, and, and grow that within your culture of encouraging critical feedback. So money tip four, um, game theory your result sharing process. Take your stakeholders' preconceptions slash misconceptions into mind. Diplomatically steer them towards what you're trying to actually communicate to them. And it ends up in the long run uh, building more trust, building more political capital, which I think we need in the community <laughs> these days. Um, and don't bury the lead. Uh, be upfront about what you're trying to say, be upfront about your inferences, uh, tack on a, a great simple visualization on top of it and that helps you um, get your work that much farther. And that's it. Um, so I hope uh, this, this provides some fodder for good, com uh, good conversation during the breakout talk and I'd love to hear your tips about how you guys share your work with your stakeholders and how you um, document and, and how you also balance the, the trouble between taking a lot of time to document your work and share your work and moving quickly.